trace your Irish roots. This show is specially for St. Patrick's Day and to show people the four pillars, the four core parts needed when you need to trace your Irish roots and how to do that free of charge as well. My name is Lorna Maloney. I'm the board direct, one of the board directors of the virtual chapter of the Association of Professional Genealogists. I'm a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, resident genealogist of Drummond and Castle County Clare, and I hold a permanent post at University College Cork. I have academic links with the University of Limerick, NUI Galway, and presently at, at Lone IT. I'm also the director of Merriman R&T 2020, but I, that company is 10 years old now. So I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today for Tracing Your Irish Roots in most unusual times when we are living through a pandemic not seen since 1918. The four pillars and how to trace your Irish roots really looks at the land records and they are the surviving records in Irish genealogy. What are they? Well, you're looking at the 1911 census, the 1901 census, Griffith's valuation and the tithe plotments. They are your four core areas and you start with the ones that are nearest your own age, which is 1911, 1901, and Griffith's valuation and the tithe. So they're all different times during the 19th century and the early 20th century, but it's very important that you start with those that are closest to you to prevent error. Genealogy, you start with yourself and you move back. We see some of our beautiful landscape in Ireland and when we're looking at it, it would sound as if it was ve all very poor and, and impoverished. But when you look out the window, you see some of the finest scapes and landscapes in the whole world. So what, what would be considered very poor land that your ancestors came from often looked very beautiful. So that's a, a kind of a paradox that you have to reconcile with yourself as well. The time frames and the genres, we're looking at 1824 to 1911. There's census substitute, you have land taxation, it's a population measurement, and it's also religious taxation when you're looking at a tithe plotment. We have many photographic collections to bring you through this. The Lawrence Collection, um, that's the French photographic collection. That's the main street of Killaloo. Um, I think that photograph is actually a bit later than that, but you're looking at the beginnings of a streetscape. And that is a very, um, it looks the same today, except you would see cars on it. You would see a different thing, but actually our landscape today because of what is going on with our pandemic is actually very much looking like this in Ireland today. So we're going, we're going back in time a good hundred years here, 150 years perhaps, to see what Ireland looked like in the past and how we reconcile the census records to this. So when tracing your Irish ancestry, you're looking that in every street, Every place was a business. So these were not residential houses. They were all businesses. There would be no house in a town that was not a major business. None of them. They would be boarding houses if they didn't hold a, a main aspect, like you have Colgans here. I'm just uh, looking at it, and that would be a haberdashery. It would have sold everything. You have two people waiting at the door. It takes a long time to take a picture, so none of these are actually in movement, if you like. Um, they they would all be waiting quite a long time because of the whole thing to be set up. It would be like you see in the westerns where they're setting up the camera and they're taking ages to, to take a photograph and so on. So you can see it's on a hill. Um, it's actually probably on the, the place where Kincora was because Killaloo 
and Baleborough are very different spaces. So this is, would be the home of Brianborough. And just to point out some of the features of a streetscape, while I can, I can, I can see that. I'll have to go back. Sorry about this. But we're looking at basically a way of determining what's going on here. So I can see, even if I was to look at a picture like this and count the residences, and then when I need to match the 1911 and 1901 census, it will be really important to do that. One of the things I need to look at when I'm looking at the census is to actually go and look at the building returns of 1901 and the 1911 census. I have an urban streetscape, type of buildings, shops, lodging houses, public houses, tailor shops, butcher shops, drapers and ownership. So the things I have to look at really are very important because what I need to be able to do is differentiate what's happening with the earlier census of 1901. Have people emigrated? Has somebody else taken over the shop? Has someone else taken over the land? Ha have people died? All the things that have happened at that time. And there's a lot going on in Ireland between 1901 and 1911 for any of you that are tracing your Irish roots. It's important to remember that, that you're looking at the emergence of Ireland as an independent state in 1921 and, and so on. And you really have to start building up your contextual history when you're tracing your Irish roots. So it's no harm for you to um, adapt to a reading list. We'll be doing a lectures on those as well. But I want to show you the building return because when you look at the 1901 census and all you've got to do is Google 1901, 1911 census, these records are freely available on char on online on the National Archives of Ireland. And here you have what's known as a Form B1, a house and building return. And here you see the parliamentary division is East Clare, the PLU, the Poor Law Union is Scarif. I'm just waving the cursor at it. I wonder will that come up in the in the uh, video? I'm not sure. Poor Law Union, Scarif, the Distral Electoral Division, DED, Killaloo, and the Townland, Shantrow, or Shantrod. And it's really important that you realise that this is in the barony of Tullaloa, the parish of Killaloo and the street is Main Street. Here we have a dwelling, public house, lodging house, shop, public house again, and it didn't look like that. So that's kind of important to kind of see that what you would have thought that it was a public house, but it is. And that those records are very important of how you see them. Now, in relation to the houses, they're all coded. So it doesn't mean it has one wall instead of four wall. Four walls are only f and four doors. These are all coded. And when you look at these, it's important to see just exactly what's going on. You have a point here. You have the doors. These are coded houses. That's a second class of house. They add up all the numbers here to come to a, a, a coding that give you the first, second, third, fourth class house. You see that Edmund, Edward Burke is living in house number one, we'll say. That could be at the top or the bottom of the house and street, depending on which census it is, whether it's 1901 or 1911. And you can see his neighbours, John McHugh, Sarah Hayes, Johanna Donahue. Honora O'Dwyer, Mary McHugh, Mary Martin, John Ryan. You're seeing quite a lot of hidden things here. Because when you just look at the census, you might see these people associated as, uh, you know, wife of or mother of. And, but you see them here, they're business owners. Like Sarah Hayes is running that public house. Joanna Donahue is running the lodging house. You see the hidden pictures of women here as well.
So go back to your streetscape again. That's your building return, your B form that you often overlook when you're looking at the 1911 and 1901 census. And I don't want you to overlook it again because you can start matching it now with what's actually going on. There's another form in it and it tells you it's the same aspect, Scarif, Killaloo, Main Street, Parish of Killaloo. You have a table, a stable, sorry, coach house, cow house, and you're looking at house number one again, where we were looking at before. Only we don't have the name this time, but it's telling you all the additional offices, out offices and farmsteadings. When you go back to Griffith's valuation, you're going to start seeing a match on what you're doing there. So you have house number two, house number three, four, so on. 1911, the tailor shop and residence of number five, Main Street, Killaloo. I see a, a, a spelling error in residence. Sorry about that. And I've clipped where you look at the tailor shop, 15, 16, 17, John Colgan, Maria Minahan, Henry P. Thompson. Suddenly I can see the different names that are coming about. And I also see some unusual surnames. Menton. Other surnames where they're lodgers. And this is the residence of the house number five in Main Street, Killaloo. John Ud when we look to Julia O'Donoghue, we see that she's running the boarding house. So that's important when you look at B because you can suddenly start matching what's going on. And this is a way to trace your Irish ancestors when you're looking at the 1911 census yourself, that you get all the forms together and you start realizing the complexities and the relationships. Here we see Margaret Conroy and she's age 13. She's a granddaughter. Now, who's she the granddaughter of? She has to be the granddaughter of Julia Donoghue. So that tells you that it's not a son of hers that's married to um, Conroy. It's, it's a daughter of hers. So Julia has a daughter who has, isn't on the census, but is, is married, who married Conroy. So that gives you another lead in. The rest are lodgers. They're no relation. So she's holding a lodging house of John Kyo, John Hayes, Patrick Redden, James Clifford, Philip Richard, Thomas Holohan, Ber Bertie Menton. You have to go back to the, rec the original as well because you're looking at transcriptions errors here. They could have Holohan spelt wrong and they're going by sound and going Holohan or Holohan. So people will translate orally. Now you might wonder what's Margaret Conroy, age 13, doing living with her grandmother? Well, she could very well be working for her grandmother. She's age 13. She's not considered a child at the age of 13 at this time. She would be of great help and possibly helping out. Now, 1901 census. So we've had the 1911 census where we looked at the streetscape just to give you a clue as to what's going on. But what's happening with the 1901 census? We have no information on the length of marriage no information on children living. So in the 1911 census, when you're looking at it, you can see whether it's the first or second marriage. People would mar marry quite quickly after a spouse died. They would not have people to mind children otherwise and so on. And so they moved on fairly quickly. Or if they if they ever did, they married quickly rather than, than waiting a length of time. Now, the 1901 census, this gives you the name, the form A form, and you have the status of marriage, though, and the rank or the profession and the education and so on, whether it's education, read or write. So they're just looking at literacy. They're not looking at anything else for your census of Ireland form A. You also have the religion, Roman Catholic. You know, and you can see the little nuances here of Catholic spelt incorrectly here. So every time you look at a census, you spot something different in every one of them. You have Wareborn, County Limerick, 
County Tipperary. Now, because there's a spelling error in this, the Roman Catholic, you know that they filled in this census themselves, and you know that this is their handwriting. And you very much really need to just see how every part of the census, form number 10, when it was taken, it was Sunday night, the 31st of March, 1901. The returns were of the family and their visitors, boarders and servants. Now, I've seen the same person two or three times on different censuses. So I've seen that they were visitors in one place, but they were filled in on the census in other places as well. So this again is the house number one in Main Street, Killaloo, for when you're tracing your Irish roots. And we have a Burke again. Oh, we have Alice Burke this time, Michael Burke, the son, Thomas Burke, George Burke, Mary Ann, Laura. And when you see house number one in 1911 and house number one in 1901, you would think they're the same Burks, but they're not. There were two families of Burks in Killaloo and it just so happened that they lived in the top and the bottom and they start doing the census reading at different ends between 1911 and 1901. So you need to be aware of that, that you may not, it may not be that your ancestors have moved between 1901 and 1911, but that the census person has started in a different place when they're recording the records. So the significant difference is because they're possibly two different books and so on. And it's, that's why it would be important not to read into the fact that Edmund Burke wasn't married to a different Nora Burke. He hadn't suddenly traded in for a new wife and got rid of all his children of the 1911 and 1901 census. So what can we do to reconcile our differences for our family trees? We look for death records. And we do that through looking at our four pillars, but then starting to use irishgenealogy.ie because we have superb death records in Ireland that are free of charge when you go on that site. And for what you would pay 30 and $40 for in other countries, you get free of charge in Ireland. And you look for the death record. You look for, so that's looking for the civil records for the children listing in 1901 to see if their father is Edward or Edmund. And you go to irishgenealogy.ie. You have to have the exact surname. So if you put in the wrong spelling or the wrong spelling that they would have had at that time, you're in trouble, you won't find it. So therefore you need to go for variance. And that's why you start learning the complexity of Irish genealogy. Of And that's why when you hire us, we do all that for you. This is a lovely example of how symbols can show you what when you see pictures and that and you're looking this is a pawnbroker and you can see by the sign outside and J Brown you can see the racks on the window that was to stop animals who were walking and running down the street every fair day in a rural town not to kick in the windows so important to see you see a bicycle that would have been a famous mode of transport back at that time and you can see exactly what they're selling and what they're loaning at that time. This again is showing the agricultural life that suddenly you start looking at the, the, the picture scapes of seeing, again, they look as if they're standing taking the time. It takes hours to take a photograph at that time. It's not a matter of taking a quick snap as it is today and running off. It's the fact that you have to set it up and it takes time. So they've been posing for maybe three quarters of an hour and that's why they're leaning up against things as well and standing with their arms folded because they're waiting they've been like actors waiting on a set as such you can see that this is the mighty river shannon and it's it's the f development of the fisheries in killaloo and that was always a very fine point of trade and you can see why it looks insignificant when you're looking at it on a map it's hugely important when you're looking at the trade of Brian Boru which is a thousand years earlier getting getting it into being a very wealthy area so what does the landscape tell us well it tells us whether it's rural urban estuaries seacoast mountains inhabitable 
uninhabitable, deserted and so on. Whether we have a very different settlement to other parts of Europe, we have a dispersed settlement pattern. So uh, that leads to your houses that are all off in the middle of nowhere and so on and not in any clear plan. Or in Rundale that they're in clock on and they're all circular and we have a very strange landscape. The rural landscapes of 1901, Isle Upper. So here we have uh, houses in Isle Upper in Isle County Clare. And we look at all the neighbours again. We can see the McNamaras, the ODs, the, Ma the McNamaras again, the Maloneys, the Murphys, the Allens, the Maloneys, the McNamaras, the Maloneys, the Griffins. So here we have Murphys. In five, we can click into the occupants, we can click into the original census form and all the census forms. In 1911, we have again where they started in a different, so the, the Murphys haven't moved into house number six. They are still in house number five as such, but it's been measured in a different way and, measure, and viewed in a different way. Or maybe houses now are deserted at that time. So you can see your comparison. You should always do this with your census of 1911 and 1901. Get the transcription, see exactly what's going on and see, you know, are there two lots? Have there, like you see two, suddenly you see two uh, names in Allen and Maloney. Well, there are two households now in virtually in that house and the same with McNamara and Maloney. Perhaps there's marriages. People have got older and so on. So important to remember just what's going on here and how things change over time. You record the differences to reconcile the differences for your family tree. You check the records to see are they the same family. You do not make assumptions or presume they are the same family because the surnames are same and you ask people in the locality or otherwise you hire people who know the locality as well. What the differences tell us? Well, the differences tell us whether there's been a difference in how the house is perceived. Maybe it's been done up so it changes from a second or fourth or third class house. Who the neighbours are still and whether there's been a change in ownership. So all these things are important. Now, when we say seascape and it's saying that it's remote and there's nothing there, suddenly we look at some of the most beautiful places and we look at some of the most interesting occupations as well. So all these are important. These places would be seen as uninhabitable, but yet are some of the finest views and make up our tourism and indeed are why our tourism is suffering today. Again, we look at areas that are absolutely stunning and they are viewed as uninhabitable on forms. So what you see on forms and what you know in reality are very different and you also have to reconcile those as well. So fabulous landscape. Now let's go on to our second, our third pillar, really, we've 1901 and 1911. Let's go on to Griffith's valuation, the primary valuation. We have 1847 and 1864. We have codes, letters, and you can get Griffith's valuation on a free source on askaboutireland.com. Ask About Ireland are all the libraries in Dublin who conglomerated together and have some fabulous sources and never will be they be more useful as what we are as we have time to look at them today land usage town land information place names and surnames so that's Griffith's valuation a primary valuation named after Richard Griffith and he would have lived to be a great age. He died in the 1890s and he was nine, nearly 90 years of age. He was very involved with the Ordnance Survey mapping and had looked at geolo geological maps of Ireland in the 1820s. It was a property tax and a census substitute. 
property tax survey carried out in the mid 19th century under the supervision of Sir Richard Griffith. The survey involved the detailed valuation of every taxable piece of agricultural or built property on the island of Ireland and was published county by county between the years 1847 and 1864. Now we can also use the Irish historical mapping tools when we're looking at this. And that was a project called AIRO, A-I-R-O, and it was done by Maynooth Castle or Maynooth University at the time. It's really good to be able to do that. So why use maps? If you look at these sources here, you can see aeromaynoothuniversity.ie because we can find our ancestors' correct location we can work out the family branches matching it to Griffith's valuation. There are many new landscape features. So we're looking at famine roads coming in about around the time of Griffith's valuation. So Griffith's valuation is capturing the change that happens between 1848 and 1864 and that's really important to remember that as well that famine roads these roads were used to create work at the time and long straight roads that sometimes didn't lead from one place to another and this is around the faecal area in Isle Upper and you can see the long straight road that would not have been created before, did not create the main road from Ennis to Scarif or anything like that, but became a new road facing towards Tulla. Then we have the areas, we have the Rue Max in the 1901 and 1911 census, and this is where they lived. So this is the landscape today, and this is the famine, the famine road cut their lands between two points. So in 1826, an act was passed in 1826, and that's why Griffith's valuation just doesn't start in 1848. It starts with the field books in the 1826s, and that's why it's really important that you realise that you can start seeing the dramatic changes that occur at this time. An act was passed in 1826 that allowed for a uniform valuation of property in all Ireland in order to levy the county cess charges and grand rate char jury rates. Thus began an assessment of the whole country, county by county, by Sir Richard Griffith. Patrick Murphy, James, was the son of James Murphy. However, here in Ireland, people of the same name could and were distinguished by nickname and thus differentiated those with the same surname in the townlands. And that's why you have the Rue Max or you have the, the Red Max, the Brown Max, the, the Green Max, all sorts of things so that they could be differentiated from people in the one locality and the same surname. So here you have Griffith's valuation, which you can clip from Ask About Ireland and you have Isle Upper you see Thomas McMahon the landlord is Thomas Brown or Joseph Brown the care he was the caretaker's house off the road and you can see it's 23 acres so he could have been moved in from that area you wouldn't know so when you see things like caretaker's house you, you see it's a caretaker you see James McNamara house and land and Cossier's house there's a few things going on here you see the little numbers showing you that land is shared and differentiated. Patrick O'Dea, Ellen Ryan, Patrick McNamara, James Murphy, John Allen, Stephen McNamara. Now, James Murphy, John Allen and Steve McNamara are all responsible for each other. We see that by that relationship there. That if one doesn't pay the other rent, the other has to and so on. And there's quite a substantial amount of land here. It's 54 acres. It's a shared amount. And it is the largest amount. So you need to look at the land amounts. You need to see that that isn't just one person owning that land. That is three. So it's divided into three. You can see it there again where the brackets are different. And you can see that 
there's a slight difference here between the brackets of how they are, they are uh, viewed and so on. So meaning of Griffith's houses as different as many roomed stone built mansions and single roomed mud walled cabins. So such fundamental differences were not noted in the valuation. They are all recorded as houses. But the size and quality differences were reflected in the rateable value values. So we need to go back again. And these are the rateable values. So you can see land. And then you can see the rates and you can see all the different amounts of money and different aspects going on there. And you have to explore it. How to decipher Griff's valuation? So there are three households, A and B, on a 54-acre plot. James Murphy, Stephen McNamara and John Allen reside in separate dwellings, but they hold the land in, uh, land in common, as denoted by the brackets. Under this, this in common system, each occupier works his own part of the land, but each tenant is financially responsible, along with all the other tenants for the full rent. In this case, if John Allen fell ill and couldn't pay his share of the rent, both James and Stephen would have to pay both shares of the rent. So you can see what closeness is happening here in relationships in Irish society and why marriages between pools of people in Isle Upper would be more likely than not. And that's what's going on there with marriages and with alliances and with people marrying in to hold lands and so on. So you go back to your James Murphy, John Allen, Stephen McNamara. You can see where they're sharing responsibility. Their houses could be very different to each other. We don't know. They might not be the same class of house at all. And that's why you go up to the 1901 and 11 census and you see what the changes in the houses are. The money value in Ireland, the currency in circulation, was the pre-decimalised British sterling, pounds, shillings and pence. 12 pence equaled 1 shilling, 20 shillings, 1 pound and so on and you have guineas as well which are a pound and a shilling and so on so just be aware that the currency is different and how it is marked down as well the records show you the name of the person from whom the property was leased the immediate lesser the description of the property the acreage of land where the property includes land and the valuation of the buildings and that's for griffith's valuation Terms common, some land in Ireland was still legally common land or commons. These were generally medieval rights allowing common use of specific lands, usually waste ground. By the mid-19th century, most common land had been enclosed under parliamentary legislation and had become the freehold property of squatters. Here you have that type of landscape again to show you what's going on with glebe land or old ruins and bits and pieces you'd have tower houses on lands as well maybe there were people living in them as well and they're just down as houses farming the size of a holding was frequently used as a rule of thumb to depict ireland's agricultural classes the holder of less than five acres was labelled a cottier or labourer. Small farmers usually held between five and thirty acres, and the larger farmers occupied more than thirty acres. So you can see now, going back to your Griffiths valuation of fifty-four acres, they were considered very large farmers, and they were also on directories as well as being large farmers. So our idea of a large farm today cannot be gone back in time of what a farm is at that time. We have the Rundale system of farming that's depicted by Griffith's valuation in some case. We have the townland of Doreen illustrating a subdivision of a tenement by a group of tenants holding a 641 acre parcel of land in common, historically termed the Rundale system of land occupancy. Under the term of the system, each tenant occupied a portion of the holding for a house and tillage use, but the tenant was financially responsible, along with his fellow tenants, for the full rent due on the entire holding. That is important, how Rundale works. Here you have an example of Rundale, and you can see A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, all the different parts. And you can see that the lesser or the landlord, Sir W. Roger Palmer, 
can see what's going on here of all the different different Granahan and the Granahans, the Careys, the McHales, the Miles, the Sheridan, the Barretts, the Sheridans again, the Mannions, the Phillips, the Clarks, the Dalys, and the the Mulherons of of that. Looking at the houses in Griffith's valuation, what would they have been like? They would have been made in limestone and you have they'll be brightly coloured in some cases and you'd also find that the whitewash was believed to kill all the germs in the house and so on. But they were brightly coloured sometimes. They put a mix through them and they made them brightly coloured and they had some windows and so on. And these are recorded. Now we're going on to the tithe plotments. This is one of our last pillars for tracing your Irish ancestry. And you see suddenly that we're looking at Isle, but we're looking at Mona Geelan. And we see different names in the tithe plotments because we have a fracture in the landscape. The, the Irish, the, the, the hunger, the great hunger, the famine, causing mayhem. Now, at the moment, historically, we're going through a pandemic. And we can see the mayhem that causes. And it's just beginning. But then we're looking at a famine that went on for two or three years. There's been no days at the moment where I haven't thought of my ancestors and thought how resilient they were and how tough they were in comparison to perhaps what I am in, and how, how non-resilient I am with the fractured landscape job. So really we're looking at a complete change in landscape. And we see handwritten records of land and tides were one tenth of their income and a religious census and often used as a census substitute. So for the tides, we see a change in place names, a loss of place names between 1824 and 1847, recognizing places because of surnames, a reduction in surnames because of the famine, collective nature of tithe plotment links. The tithe Deployment books are a vital source for genealogical research for the pre-famine period, given the loss of the 1821 and 1851 census records. They were compiled between 1823 and 1837 in order to determine the amount which occupiers of agricultural holdings over one acre should pay in tithes to the Church of Ireland, the main Protestant church, and the church established by the state until its disestablishment in 1871. So that's the end of tracing your Irish ancestors and you can look and see just what's going on at that time.